A very good evening, everybody. On behalf of the Coaches for You community, I, Pradeep Natarajan, would like to welcome you tonight to a freewheeling dialogue with Dr. Shri Kumar Rao on his masterful journey as a coach and his pioneering CPM program, Creativity and Personal Mastery. Dr. Shri Kumar Rao has helped thousands of entrepreneurs and executives worldwide achieve a quantum breakthrough in their personal and professional lives. He has helped them reach entirely new orbits of success and accomplishment. And they have done so while rediscovering joy in life and genuine unadulterated happiness. Undoubtedly, he is addressed as the happiness guru. Dr. Rao has been among the highest rated and most popular professors at many of the world's top business schools. His work has been featured in major media worldwide and his TED talk has been viewed millions on different sites. Dr. Shri Krumar Rao was an executive at Warner Communications and McGraw Hill before he created the celebrated MBA course, Creativity and Personal Mastery. The course, the only business course that has its own alumni association, shows students how to discover their unique purpose, creativity and happiness through group work and a philosophical perspective. Dr. Rao is also an advisor to senior business executors whom he helps find deeper meaning and engagement in their work. He's the author of four books, Are You Ready to Succeed? The second, The Personal Mastery Program, Discovering Passion and Purpose in Your Life and Work. Happiness at Work, Be Resilient, Motivated and Successful and last but not the least, The Happiness Matrix. Dr. Rao's life work is to help people effect this transformation in their lives. He is an elite coach for persons seeking spiritual growth who also want to leave an outsized impact of the world. I think I can go on and on, but uh, for brevity of the conversation, I would now like to extend our warm regards and welcome to Dr. Shri Kumar Rao. Welcome, Dr. Rao. Thank you, Pradeep. I'm very glad to be with you. And thank you to everyone who's on the call for taking time off from your undoubtedly busy day to be with us today. So, sir, as uh, I had uh, talked to you earlier about our community, we are predominantly uh, in the audience out here, a community of coaches. Uh, through an initiative named Coaches for You, uh, which has been specifically uh, made during the COVID times to extend our support uh, to the community at large through a coaching work and also being a support system for coaches during these hard times. And, That's uh, a wonderful initiative, Pradeep. Especially during this time, there are a lot of people who are feeling Emotional turmoil of various kinds. So giving them pro bono coaching as you're doing, that's a wonderful service. Yes, sir. And we are, we are trying to reach out to as many people to even educate about coaching to, so that more and more people can come to it and take advantage during these times. So uh, as we note, this conversational dialogue that we're having today is on your masterful journey as a coach. So... Uh, we would love to understand from you what have been some of your uh, childhood early influences that led to you become a coach in the first place. Not sure I can make a direct link, but let me tell you some of the things from my childhood that really uh, had an impact on me. My mother was a very spiritual lady. And from a very young age, I had persons of great spiritual power who were a regular part of my life. Like Maharshi Mahesh Yogi, for example, used to come and stay with us when we were in Rangoon. This was when he had just come back from the mountains and long before he was discovered by the Beatles and Mia Farrow and became a worldwide celebrity. And several of the senior Ramakrishna Mission monks, including the presidents of the uh, organization. These were all the people who were the direct disciples of the direct disciples of Ramakrishna. So I heard someone say, huh? So many people like that were a regular part of my life. 
so and uh, i used to basically listen in when they were having conversations and such so at that time it didn't make any sense but i guess a lot of it kind of seeped in by osmosis and then i came to america and when i did my i was doing my phd at columbia business school and ramdas whom i'm sure many of your members know used to be in uh, the same vicinity so i used to spend time with him and i devoured all his books and uh, gradually you know they started making a lot of sense to me and then i went into corporate america i was hugely successful initially i got burnt out by corporate politics i thought i'd go into academe where there is no politics i was sadly mistaken there is a lot of politics in the university environment so i made the transition however and then i was stuck and i was feeling very burnt out and uh, i felt uh, you know i was stagnating i felt i had such great education such a wonderful early career and i've blown it all and the thing that sustained me is all of the reading that i was doing basically spiritual biography mystical autobiography they would take me to a wonderful place and then i came back to the real world and it was terrible <laughs> so i started thinking that if all of this was useful only if you were sitting quietly thinking peaceful thoughts but not when you came to the hurly burly then it's useless mm-hmm. but somehow i knew that wasn't true i knew that this was very valuable maybe even the only thing that was valuable i just hadn't figured out how to make use of it so one day i came up with my bright idea which is why don't i take a course create a course which takes the teachings of the world's greatest masters strips them of religious cultural other connotations and adapts them into exercises which are acceptable to highly intelligent people in a post industrial society and the thought of doing that made me come alive initially i felt a little bit of a fraud because i hadn't figured out how to make use of it and i was going to create a course to teach people how to make use of it but i thought you know we we'll learn together and battle our way through so i offered that course and uh, it did well i moved it to columbia business school in 1999 and it exploded it was the only course that was a university wide draw at students from law school from business school from the school of international and public affairs from journalism teachers college all over the place it got a lot of publicity in major media and then it spread by word of mouth so i've taught it at many top business schools at columbia at london business school at kellogg at berkeley at imperial college and now i teach it privately in new york london and san francisco uh life courses are temporarily suspended because of uh, coronavirus but my online courses are going on i in fact a new one is starting this coming sunday and there will be another one probably in the start of next year so that's how my journey came about because i realized by the way that all of the problems that i was prey to i was not unique i thought i was unique but i wasn't it's very 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 widespread oh uh that that's so frank and honest of you to say that but i am sure still you have etched uh, through your work whatever is possible in terms of the work of the great masters that you have so beautifully uh woven together and taken it to the world and that is i guess uh, uh, commendable indeed thank you yes uh, you know my job as i like to say is basically i am a translator so i have taken these great masters teachings and these were great masters who completely understood the human predicament and they have the ability to impact and transform lives so what i've done is i've taken those teachings and adapted them so i'm a translator You know Newton said if i can see further than most it's because i'm standing on the shoulders of giants. Yes. <laughs> i'm standing on the shoulders of some very very <laughs> tall giants. So yeah. All the credit goes to them. I'm just a translator. I recognize there's value in translation, but these are not my concepts. I'm just channeling some really great souls. Yes, yes indeed because uh, each of your teachings is so simple so understandable that right from a youth to a old person can quite relate to it easily and can apply it in everyday life and i think that is what instantly makes you that happiness guru and also leaves the other person the reader or the listener with happiness uh, that's indeed profound though 
Your translations you. are also profound, I should say. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Rao, we see that you are a coach, you are a motivational speaker, you are a top management consultant. How do you really don these varied hats, especially with each one's approach being so different? Actually, I don't think of it as wearing different hats, Radeep. And I certainly don't think of myself as a motivational speaker mm -hmm. because motivational speakers come up and they, you know, communicate basically their personality to a certain extent to the audience who get all pumped up. And then Monday morning rolls around and you're back to where you were before. Uh, I don't like to, th I don't think of myself as a motivational speaker. I think of myself as someone who is helping transmit great truths. And if you listen to these great truths and even make even a half-hearted attempt to actually implement them in your life, your life will change. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So if someone goes off saying, gee, that was a great talk, then from my point of view, it's a failure. But if someone goes back and says, let me try it on Sunday, on Monday morning and see what happens, and I'll stick with it for at least a week, then in my book, that's a success. Because if anyone takes what I'm sharing and tries it out, don't have to believe anything, but if you try it out in your life, your life will change. No ifs, ands, or buts. You go try it out, your life will change. Right. Dr. Rao, you've been a, a personal mastery coach uh, to many business leaders. Uh, through these decades that you have co-partnered with them in their personal development journeys and their lives, uh, what are three of the biggest leadership challenges that uh, they might have faced? The biggest leader... Actually, I'd like to make a distinction here because I don't think of myself as a coach for leaders. Because let me explain my philosophy of... Uh, leadership. And this is important. So many of you might find it at least useful to think about regardless of whether you agree with me or not. In my early days, when I was a new public speaker, I used to ask a question, how many of you here want to be inspiring leaders? And as you can imagine, practically everybody struck the hands up. And then I would say, if you want to be an inspiring leader, you're already pretty well advanced on the wrong path. And then they'd be kind of embarrassed that have the hands up so they wouldn't put it down, but they'd kind of bring it down and they'd have the hands half up. I don't do that anymore because I don't like to embarrass my audiences. I did that when I was a rookie speaker. But I was actually quite honest on that. If you want to be an inspiring leader, it's all about you. I want to be an inspiring leader. And what you're really saying is I want people to do what I would like them to do, which perhaps they don't want to do. So I've got to figure out how to get people to do what I want them to do when they don't want to do what I want them to do, which is I've got to learn how to manipulate people. Now, I'm being deliberately provocative here, but there is a fair amount of truth in what I'm saying. So when you want to be an inspiring leader, it's all about you. And this is not a journey about you. So if you want to be an inspiring leader, the best way to do that is don't even try. Instead, be personally inspired. When you're personally inspired by a goal which is bigger than you are, and it brings a greater good to a greater community, and you learn to communicate that vision, then you become an inspiring leader by default, because anybody who comes in contact with you cannot help but be inspired. You know, it's a little bit like when Gandhi was starting off his work in uh, South Africa. He didn't say, you know, I want to be an inspiring leader. I want millions of people to follow me. His take was the passport laws are unjust and I will not let them stand. And he was a British trained attorney. He was verbally fluent and he used whatever skills he had to muster support for the proposition that uh, uh, the <clears throat> passport laws are unjust and I will not let them stand. And in the process of doing that, he became an inspiring leader. And later on, he came to India to lead the fight against colonial government and uh, you know, applied the same principles there. And by default, he became someone who, even 70 years after his assassination, is still revered by many. 
Now, there are a lot of criticisms of his uh, political stances and the particular actions that he took. But there is one thing which Gandhi did, which is unquestionable and which is so rare in the world today. And that is that he was able to inspire tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people to think beyond their narrow self-interest into what is something that I can do which is for the greater community. And that is remarkable. So if you want to be an inspiring leader, don't even try. Just be personally inspired. And when you're personally inspired by a vision which brings a greater good to a greater community and you have uh, tremendous flexibility in defining both the greater good and the greater mm -hmm. community. But when you're personally inspired and you learn to communicate that vision, and that communication is a lifelong occupation, by the way. It's not you give one speech and you're done. You have to constantly, constantly, constantly do that. And when you hold it up and when you're holding people up so that they become elevated, you find that you are a, a leader there. A lot of the times when you talk about, I want to be a great leader and I want people to do well, there is a transactional element in there. Let me explain what I mean. You know, I've got a bunch of subordinates reporting to, them, to me and I want to help them. And I want to help them because I want them to reach their numbers. Because if they reach their numbers, I reach my numbers and good things happen to me. So what you're basically doing is you're looking at other people as instruments who are going to do stuff for you. Right. That automatically makes it a transaction. But instead, if you use the attitude which I advocate, which is for whatever reason, fate, destiny, karma, we are together in this role at this moment. And it is my job to help elevate your level of consciousness to the extent of which I am capable and I will do it simply because that is my role. And in the process of trying to do that, I'm really working on myself. And if I succeed and you are better off and not just better off in terms of what you're doing uh, in the company and work, but better off as a human being, if I can help you to cope better with all of the stresses and strains you have in your life, wherever they come from, then I will have done my duty. And if you have that, you will find you become a leader who, I mean, people will lay their heads on the rail for you. Oh, that's uh, a really very beautiful and insightful look at leadership. And uh, thanks for sharing uh, that. I think that's a totally new perspective of looking at uh, leadership. Yes, uh, I think it is. Uh, no, I've never heard anyone articulate it the way that I've just shared with you. Yes, truly. I, I'm still uh, trying to seep it in because it's, it's such a different way of looking at it, but it's true. And especially when we are talking about uh, having to subtly manipulate it because we want someone to follow us and we want it the way it is. And uh, we as coaches, uh, the first thing that we have to do is work according to the coach's agenda, not our agenda. Mm -hmm. uh, in that light, uh, as we are a community of coaches here today, and many among us are also assisting leaders and high potentials in organizations uh, to overcome their leadership challenges. Uh, if we have to contextually look at the coach as a leader, uh, what are your thoughts on how coaches can be conscious transformational agents for the many challenges that the world is facing today? That again is a function of the coach and how strongly the coach, how strongly he or she is anchored in their particular worldview. I don't even like the term coach, to be honest. So if you go to my website, I say, look, you know, I'm, I'm not a coach. I'm a friend, philosopher and guide. Because typically, here's how coaching works. And, you know, I'm generalizing here. So obviously, there are exceptions. But an uh, executive or someone realizes, you know, there is a gap in my competency or my skill level and I have to fill that. Either the executive decides that or more common, the company decides that you need ball string in this area. Could be in uh, resolving conflict, could be in team building, could be in leadership, whatever. So you go to persons who 
supposedly have skills helping people come to that area. And then you basically agree on terms of engagement. Here's how much it's going to cost. Here's how long it's going to take. This is what the end result is going to be. And this is the modality. We're going to meet X times per week or month or whatever for so long and you'll do exercises. So it's all very organized and laid out and, you know, <clears throat> metricized to the extent possible. I don't work like that. So if anybody comes to me and says, you know, this, this is the structure I want, automatically disqualifies himself as a person to work with. Uh, I prefer, as I said, the term friend, philosopher, and guide. And the most famous example of that is probably Aristotle and Alexander. Alexander was a very willful child. And his father, Philip of Macedonia, didn't know how to deal with him. So he asked Aristotle, you know, would you please talk to my son? So Aristotle started working with Alexander and they worked together for three years. And you can bet your boots that Aristotle didn't tell Alexander how to be a better swordsman or how to lay siege to a mountain fortress. They talked about Homer, they talked about philosophy, they talked about meaning of life. But at the end of three years, Alexander became the kind of person he became and then he went on to do what he did. So in a coaching engagement with me, if somebody comes and says, you know, here is what I need. I need uh, to know how to build an efficient team or resolve conflict. I don't work with that person. I have people, I have a very extensive screening process that I put persons through. They have to read my syllabus, watch my TED talk and see what it is about my approach and my philosophy that resonates with them. And then and only then after I'm highly convinced that they are ready to engage with the topics that I raise, that we talk seriously about perhaps my becoming a coach for them. But if not, I mean, you put it this way, you can't decide I want to have Dr. Rao as a coach. Wow. You, know, you, you have to qualify before I work with you. And the reason for that is very simple. I've got such an unusual approach that unless I have someone who already resonates with my worldview, it's not going to be a success. It'll be a waste of their time and money, and it'll be a non-fulfilling engagement for me. So I don't do it. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's very interesting to note. And uh, I heard you say about, uh, you know, they having the same type of a worldview. So just curious to know, what's your worldview, Dr. Rao? That's a tough question to answer in the context of such a brief conversation, but let me give an effect. My worldview is that the only thing you ever do in life, Pradeep, is you work on yourself. Mm -hmm. The universe gives you many tools, gives you your partner, your wife, your children, your parents, your work as a coach, your, the clients that uh, you engage with. Each one of these is a tool. In every role, you try to do the best possible job you can. You try to be the best possible son you can be. You try to be the best possible father you can be. You try to be a good husband. But in the process of doing all of these things, what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. You're given a bunch of situations. Each of these situations is a tool given to you by the universe. And you use these tools as skillfully as you can. But in the process of doing that, what you are really doing is working on yourself. And the only thing you ever do in life is you work on yourself. You can work on yourself consciously, which I advocate, or you can work on yourself by happenstance, which is probably what the overwhelming majority of people do. But essentially, that's what you're doing. And the more you recognize that everything that is given to you is a tool to help you grow, then you become incredibly resilient because there's no such thing as a failure. You know, you tried something and it didn't work. And what is important is the lesson and the learning. You know, I talk a great deal about a very important principle, which is invest in the process. Do not invest in the outcome. Most of us are very hung up on the outcome. Am I going to reach my goal or am I not going to reach my goal? Am I going to become CEO or am I not going to become CEO? All of those things are totally out of your control because any number of things can happen which will throw your plans into a cocked hat. Like right now, for example, the coronavirus has upended business like nothing else. 
You know, my wife and I are tennis fanatics and uh, we've been to the French Open many times. We two years ago went to the Australian Open. We go every year to the US Open. This is the year that we were going to go to Wimbledon. So I bought the tickets last year. And at that time, if somebody had said, you won't be able to see Wimbledon, I'd say, yeah, that's possible. But in my thoughts would have been something like perhaps somebody fell ill as a result of which I couldn't go. I would never have imagined that I wouldn't go because the tournament itself was cancelled. And on top of that, there are no flights between uh, New York and London, which uh, will permit you to fly. So okay. unexpected things happen all the time. You don't have any control. So the purpose of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is not achieving the goal. The purpose of setting a goal and trying your level best to achieve the goal is the learning and growth that happen in you and to you as you try your level best to achieve the goal. If you actually achieve the goal, that is a bonus. Be immensely grateful. If you don't achieve the goal, the learning and growth have already happened. So it's ahead of the game. So there's no such thing as failure that you have to sit back and cry and say, oh my God, I failed, what's gonna happen? Because you have a different perspective on life. So in my coaching engagements, what I typically do is I get persons to embrace a different worldview. And when they do that, all kinds of things happen by magic in their life. They become largely free of stress, become incredibly resilient. They have a completely different perspective on their life and what happens, relationships improve across the board. Literally, magic happens. Right. So uh, in these uh, challenging COVID times, I think the, the buzzword that everyone is using today in the world of personal development is resilience. And uh, I just uh, heard you mention about extreme resilience. And it was really very interesting. Uh, could you elaborate more on extreme resilience? Certainly. Resilience, of course, is your ability to bounce back from adversity. And, you know, it is such a uh, quality prized in executives that many often, even in prestigious magazines like The Economist, they specifically put down that as a qualification. We're looking for someone who is resilient. And in interview questions, you're frequently asked to demonstrate an occasion where you displayed resilience. Now, resilience is wonderful, but I am a uh, advocate for extreme resilience. And in extreme resilience, you bounce back so quickly from adversity that someone looking from outside, an external person, might not even know that you had suffered an adverse event. And that is eminently doable. You know, there's a very famous Sufi tale, and uh, <clears throat> there are many versions of that, but I uh, <clears throat> like the one that I'm about to share with you. Mm -hmm. Talked about a man and his son who lived in a beautiful valley, and they were very happy, but they were very, very poor. And the man got sick and tired of being poor, and he decided he was going to improve his financial status, and he was going to do it by breeding horses. So he bought a stallion. He didn't have enough money to buy a stallion, so he borrowed heavily from the neighbors. And the very day he got the stallion, he kicked the top bar loose from the paddock where he housed it and ran away. And the neighbors came around and said, you were going to become a rich man, and your stallion has run away, but you still owe us money. <laughs> you are in a bad place. And the man shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows. That, man, that stallion fell in with a group of wild horses, which were close to where he lived, and he was able to entice all of them into his paddock, which he had repaired, so escape was no longer possible. So all of a sudden, he had his stallion back, plus a dozen wild horses, which by the status of that village made him a wealthy man. And the neighbors came around, and they were probably envious, and they said, we thought you were destitute, but fortune has smiled upon you. How lucky you are. He shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? The man and his son started to break the horses so they could sell them on the market. And one of the horses threw the man's son and stomped on his leg, and it broke, and it healed crooked. And the neighbors came around saying, he was such a fine young lad, and now he'll never be able to find a girl to marry him. How unfortunate. And he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? That summer, the king of the country declared war on a neighboring country and press gangs moved through the villages, rounding up all the able-bodied young men to serve in the army. But this man's son was spared because he had a game leg and the neighbors had tears in their eyes as they came around. We don't know if we'll ever see our sons alive again, but you still have your son. How lucky you are. 
and he shrugged his shoulder and said, good thing, bad thing, who knows? And it goes on like that forever. But there's a lesson in there, Pradeep. And the lesson is, can you go back in your life and think about some event that at the time it happened, you thought this is terrible, but now you can look back upon it and say, hey, that wasn't terrible, or even that was good. I'm sure you can, lots of people can. Mm. So if something happened in the past that at the time it happened, you thought it was terrible, but now you can look back upon it and say it wasn't so bad or even it was actually good, then is there any possibility that what you're today about to label bad, is there any possibility that in five years, 10 years, it could turn out good? Is there a possibility? Just asking that question will take you away from the emotional domain you're occupying, will take you away from the domain of despair to the domain of possibility. And if you ask yourself the next question, is there anything I can do to actually make that happen? Then you move seamlessly from despair to resilience, to hope. That's what I advocate. Because if you look at it, why do you need to be resilient? You need to be resilient because you're despondent because something happened to you. And something happened to you because you're very obsessed about a particular outcome and the outcome you wanted did not happen. But if you look at the outcome as it is the outcome that matters, it's the learning and growth that happened to me, then you're never despondent. And then if you look at any event that happens and you don't label it, this is bad. You simply say, this happened. And then the next question is, where do I go from here? And that's where you focus your attention. You'll find, voila, you are never depressed. You don't even have to be resilient because there's nothing that gets you down in the first place. That's how you become extremely resilient. You watch your mental chatter, anything that happens to you, you resolutely do not label it bad. Because understand, suffering doesn't happen when an event occurs. Suffering happens only when you label that event, this is bad, this is terrible. In most instances, we do it so fast, we never recognize that they're two separate actions, but they are. An event happens and you observe it and you immediately decide this is bad. And the moment you decide this is bad, suffering happens. But you can learn not to label it bad. You can learn to label it, this happened. And if you do that, you will find that you don't need to have resilience training. You're automatically resilient. Nothing is ever going to face you. It's really as simple as that. Yes, that's true. But not and necessarily easy. You have to work it's at not it. not easy. I was just going to say that. <laughs> it needs to uh, be about doing a lot of work on yourself. Absolutely. And... Uh, Many people have put in this question, uh, uh, which we collected before the session, and predominantly the, uh, the, the most asked for question was, mm -hmm. I have been on the personal development path for years, but I am unable to be consistent and sustain it. What is the secret sauce to make sure that I can make a difference and be consistent about it? Repeat the question. Yeah. In personal development, what most people have asked for is that it's very challenging to remain consistent in your personal development. Like you break down, you follow a particular habit for a few days and then it's gone. Especially when it comes to like all of us know, for example, that we, we are labeling things. We are bringing about things from our memory. We are getting it from all conscious and unconscious thoughts that are running us. But still, we run it for a few days and then it's like back to normal. So they're asking for the secret sauce from you as to how to sustain and keep it consistent. There is no, quote, secret sauce, unquote, Pradeep, but I have several suggestions. Mm -hmm. One of the suggestions is don't try to do it by yourself. Form a small group of people who are interested in personal growth and who are accountable to each other. In my book, Are You Ready to Succeed? And that's available mm -hmm. on uh, Amazon or uh, uh, Flipkart in India. The first yeah. chapters are devoted to how you go about finding and setting up such a group. The second thing is be observant of your mental chatter. That's hugely important. 
because all of the problems that are caused in your life are caused by your mental chatter. And let me show you, all of you have smartphones. Here's my smartphone, and this is the alarm section. Oops. Just look at how many alarms I have. The number I that I have that. set up, okay? So what I do is I have 15 or more times when it beeps at random. And every time it beeps, I go back and look at what is my mental chatter? Where is it taking me? Is this a place that I want to spend time in? And as you do that, you will find that the overwhelming majority of problems in your life are caused by your mental chatter. Why am I not persistent? I failed yet again. I thought I would do this, but I am not. I have no willpower. I will never. That's all mental chatter. Our problem is we believe our mental chatter, no matter how many times it's led us astray. And the first thing that you need to do is become the observer of your mental chatter. Our problems are we become our mental chatter. Don't become your mental chatter. Be the, mm -hmm. Remain the observer of your mental chatter. And as you get a hold of that, as you remain in the witness state, mm -hmm. you will find that it has less and less opportunity to drive you to places you want, want to, oh, don't want to go. That is a first step. It's a basic step, but it will help a long way towards solving this particular problem. I guess uh, that's, that's, that's a very uh, beautiful reminder that you said. And uh, yeah, uh, the alarm is one of the best ways to drive awareness. Absolutely. Uh, yes. And the more aware we are about this mental chatter, I guess, the lesser significant it's going to become because you're going to respond to it differently. And yes. uh, that brings me to the next question of a fad that is happening all around us. And that's about mindfulness. Mm -hmm. uh, where do you find mindfulness in all of this? And what are your views on mindfulness? Mindfulness is probably the most important single concept that you can have for your well being. And mindfulness is actually not complicated, it's simply being where you are. You know, the title of Ram Das's book, and this book also had a profound influence in me, says it all be here now. A lot of the times when we're there, we're not really there. We're always looking for what do I have to do after that? So let me share a Taoist slash Zen saying for you, which is really very profound. The purpose of washing dishes is not to get them clean. The purpose of washing dishes is to wash the dishes. Now that sounds enigmatic, but it's really profound. The purpose of washing dishes is to wash the dishes. When you are there, actually do it. Feel the detergent on your hands, feel the water, the warm water on there, feel yourself scrubbing that. In the process of washing the dishes, they will get clean, but don't think about the getting clean. The purpose of washing dishes is to wash the dishes. Let me share a story with you. This, this is something that probably make a lot of sense. I was teaching in London Business School, Mm -hmm. And there was one of my students who got a tremendous amount of my pro course. He really felt that his life had been transformed. And at that time, he was going through a somewhat messy divorce. And uh, he had a son, about 80 years or so. And uh, one day he was talking to his son. And he said, you know, daddy and mommy are not going to be together anymore. Yes. And daddy and mommy are going to live in different countries. She was going to go move to another country after the divorce. Yes. And he said, you know, let's talk about how being in different countries could actually be a good thing rather than a bad thing. And they got into it tentatively. And the boy said, well, when I'm with mommy, I'll be in the country. When I'm with daddy, I'm going to be in the metropolis. And I have different sets of friends. And I have, you know, toys which are different. And I'll take airplane rides. And he really liked airplane rides. I can have lots of airplane life. And then he started becoming excited. So they played for about 15 minutes. And he was all happy and excited. And my student said, boy, that really worked. I'm so glad. <laughs> so then he asked his son, and what more can I do for you? And the son said, I wish you'd talk to me like you just did. Most of the time when you're there, you're not there. 
And that's when he realized when he was with his son, he was not really, and he said it with such pathos in his voice. I swear, half the class was crying. So be here now. When you're there, be there. And you will find that a lot of these things which are problematic, quote unquote, are not really there. Because when you are there, your mental chatter is not running you ragged. And the majority of the problems you have in your life come from your mental chatter from becoming your mental chatter as opposed to observing your mental chatter. Right. Uh, often uh, there are a few executive coaches who have uh, thrown up this question especially, and they're asking that, uh, how do you bridge spirituality with so-called cognitive corporate people? Don't ever mention spirituality. I never mention spirituality except for the fact that I put on my website and tell everyone I draw my teachings, I draw what I share from the world's greatest masters, except for that, I never mention it. Why spirituality is a label? Why do you want to use that label? It serves nothing, it serves no purpose. No, but even without using the labels, if you're going to be talking on anything like a transformational presence or uh, how transformation is about, you know, don't aim for transformation, Developing. Pradeep. The more hmm. you aim for trans uh, transformation, the more you, you know, you're becoming goal-obsessed. Don't aim for that. Transformation will happen. Don't Great. aim for Great transformation. Point. Let it evolve organically. Don't say, I'm going to work with my coach and therefore he or she is going to become that. No, let the process evolve. Very often the changes that happen are completely different from what you thought would happen and they're infinitely better than anything that you could have planned or orchestrated. Let the process unfold. Practice your preaching. If you invest in the process, not in the outcome, then get it out of your head that you're a transformational coach. Mm. Don't even think about that. That's really powerful. You do your thing, huh? Yes. And you do thing, your thing to the best of your ability and what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. And in the process, you know, other people come in the slipstream and they benefit. Wonderful. But what you're really doing is you're working on yourself. So get it out of your head that you're a transformational coach and you're transforming others. Bullshit. You have a tough enough time transforming yourself. Yeah, that's true. Thank you. Thank you for that awareness because uh, you're very well, huh? that was really very insightful because uh, we we often don't even understand subtly that how we are goal oriented and we still think about, you know, a transformational approach. Absolutely. It not be with the goal in mind. Mm -hmm. It needs to evolve naturally. Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Rao, uh, as coaches out here, what is a message that you would like to give to this whole community? What is it that you would want to share with us today? Go through life and recognize that there is some process at work which we do not understand, which brings you in touch with certain persons, leads you to adopt certain roles that you have, and do the very best that you can in your role. In every conversation that you have with everyone, ask yourself, am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? This comes from the Native American tradition. And there's, again, several versions of this story, but I like the one I'm about to share with you. There was a young man growing up and he was going to take his place with the adults of the tribe. And mm -hmm. the final rite of passage was a conversation with the medicine man. And the medicine man told him, here is this dog, kind, intelligent, loving, trustworthy. And here is this wolf, malvolent, vicious, cruel, ready to strike at and kill anything. And the dog and the wolf are fighting. And the dog and the wolf are both inside you. And the young man asks, which one's going to win? And the medicine man says, whichever one you feed. Now think about it. Inside each one of us is the notion that we should help others and make the world a better place. And inside each one of us is a, let me grab everything I can mm. for myself and the devil take the hindmost. And these impulses are always fighting. It's your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in you. It's also your job to selectively identify and feed the dog in everybody you meet. 
And when the dog in you becomes friends with the dog in the other person, magic happens in both your lives. Too often we feed the wolf in ourselves and the other person and we don't even recognize we've done that. You know, you are having a bad day at work and you go to the coffee machine and you meet a colleague and he says, I'm having a bad day at work. And you say, you're having a bad day at work. Let me tell you about my bad day at work. And your bad day at work trumps his bad day at work and you go off feeling smug and you don't recognize that you fed the wolf both in yourself and the other person. If instead you'd gone, you're having a bad day, I am having a bad day. You know, we both work here. Is there anything we can do together to ensure that none of us has such a bad day again? And now you started feeding the dog. Hmm. So in every conversation you have with everyone, with the, with the guy who, the Ola guy who takes you to the airport, with the Uber Eats guy who delivers your meal, you know, with the person who buys your newspaper or the person who comes to cook and clean for you or your colleague. Every time you have a conversation, ask yourself, am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Am I doing something which leaves this person feeling better about his or her situation, more elevated, more spiritually aware, more positive about life, more optimistic? Or am I doing something which is pushing him or her down into a, a vortex. Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? If you consciously ask yourself that question with every interaction that you have, you will find that the topics you talk about, the attitude you have, they all change. And that's such a simple mnemonic. Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Just ask yourself that question with every interaction you have. With your, with your partner, with your wife, your husband, your children, your parents. You can do it across the board. Am I feeding the dog or am I feeding the wolf? Right. So we can uh, now have uh, uh, the house open to questions. And uh, you all can please put in or we can even unmute yourself and ask a quick question. You may raise your hand. If there are any questions on the chat box, Pradeep, why don't yes. you look at that? Yes, and there, is a, there, is, yeah. there, is, uh, there is a long question out here. Uh, this is from Rakshit. He writes, right. mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Rao, thanks for your wonderful insights on a larger holistic landscape. Your quote about Ramdas and his influence on your journey. Ramdas talks about unbearable compassion and tapping the infinite inside and suggests about the only thing one can offer is his own being, which in a coaching context relates to, a, to creating presence. Now, you also mentioned about not being outcome focused, but more on the journey to the outcome. Now, with my being as a coach and a coach's focus on the outcome, do you have any examples or anecdotes of helping your coachee tap into this infinite where transformation moves from the outcome focus to the journey of the outcome and the unbearable compa compassion transpired? That's a very good question. Obviously, the person is familiar with uh, some of Rab Das's teaching. This is a process of evolution because in the beginning, when you're focused on, particularly if you're a beginning coach and uh, you're very concerned about you know, I have to get clients and I have to make a certain amount of income in order to meet my needs. And you're not very selective and you go on. So I can understand that everybody's been through that stage, through that, that phase. But presence is something that you generate when you are anchored in the timeless truths that I have shared with you. And when you're anchored in that, you radiate a presence which is felt by everyone. So until you get to that stage, you do what you've probably always been doing, which is, you know, here is how I am, and I'm going to focus on the outcome rather than on the process, and continue working as you are, but recognize that this transformation is what I'm advocating, and start work on the transformation sooner rather than later. And always be aware that 
in a sense, we're all vibrating and we're sending out different vibrations. Mm -hmm. Vibrations. I'm sure all of you have been in the presence of someone, could be a senior leader or a manager, and he or she is so much on edge and so anxiety driven that it's like a palpable presence which hits you and rubs you the wrong way. And you find yourself getting edgy and anxious. What's just happened is this person has pulled you into his vortex. Your job is to cultivate a powerful sense of calm, which is so strong that you suck that person into your vortex. And if you're not able to do that, it simply shows you that you're not yet anchored in your presence. There was a wonderful tale uh, that Ramakrishna used to tell and it talked about an old man and he had a disciple, he was a sage and he had a disciple who was constantly asking him, you know, when will I become enlightened? I'd want to become enlightened. And one day he said, come out with me uh, to the river uh, where they bathed. And when they went out in the middle of the river, he grabbed his uh, young man's head and held it underwater. And the man struggled and he kept holding it water until finally, you know, the <clears throat> a young man, literally threw the old man up and came up and started gasping for air. And then he asked the sage, why did you do that? And the old man said, when your desire for God becomes as great as your desire for the next breath when you were underwater, then you will find him standing before you. So it's a metaphor, but as with all such parables, there is a lesson in there when you are so firmly anchored in your being that you don't need the other person, that's when you will radiate the presence which will attract other people. So understand that, uh, and again, Ramakrishna said this beautifully, he said, the flower blooms and the bee finds it. So you don't have to go about and do all kinds of heroic things and market yourself and how good you are and so on. Your job is to bloom. And when you bloom, the bee will find you. And if the bees are not coming, it's a sign to you, a clear sign, that there is a lot of blooming you have left to do. This is somewhat contentious as a statement, and I will stand by it, but explaining it will take much, mm -hmm. much, much longer than a brief call, but I want to leave that as a passing thought. Very insightful indeed, uh, Dr. Rao. Uh, there, there's another question here from uh, Nikhil. Yeah. Nikhil Benegal. How different is meaning in life versus chasing happiness? You can't chase happiness. In fact, if you chase happiness by want to be happy, then by definition, you are not and will not. Happiness ensues as the unintended byproduct of your first, uh, of pursuing a goal which is much bigger than you are, and you're not even pursuing the goal, you're heading in that general direction. So you cannot chase happiness. It has to ensue. And the more you're concerned about your happiness, the less likely you are. Right now, at this instant, with all of the problems you have, you've got everything that you need to be a fulfilled soul. You know, the Upanishads say it beautifully, Purnamadam, Purnamidam. Right now, this instant, you are full. Your job is to recognize that, not chase it, and say, I'm going to do this, and this will make me full. No. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. We have uh, another question from uh, Ujwal Buj. Mm -hmm. So if I can request you to go back in that moment when you realized that you need to make a major shift in your life, were there any challenges in working on yourself? If so, how did you overcome? Lots of challenges. And there always are challenges. You're, you have financial pressures. You have relationship issues. You have uh you know, children issues and you know, all kinds of things. These are always uh, challenges. And initially I used to think of them as major problems. And uh, now I simply view them as, you know, this happens. I've got a very good example of that. Let's say I'm a county executive and you are a civil engineer 
And I call you in my office and say, I want a road built from here to here. And where the road is being built, there is a mountain, a forest, and a swamp. Do you get angry at the mountain, the forest, and the swamp? Of course not. You know, that's the terrain you've been given. And your skill as a civil engineer will depend on how do you get the road built? And if it turns out the mountain is made of granite and the swamp is really deep, you might think in terms of doubling your fee. But apart from that, it will have no impact on your well-being. Because your skill as a civil engineer will determine how the road gets built. And will you go over, under, through, or around the obstacles, right? In exactly the same way, you're the civil engineer of your life. You're the person building the road to a fulfilled, meaningful existence where you're radiantly alive every day. And all of the challenges you have, all of the problem people in your life, your you know, your nagging partner, your disobedient children, your obstreperous boss, your financial issues. They're the mountains, the forests, and the swamp. They're the terrain you're given. You don't get angry at them. You just figure out how you're going to get the road built. So if you ask yourself a question, anytime you're getting overwhelmed, am I being a civil engineer? And you'll find that, no, you're not being a civil engineer. The answer is, go be a civil engineer. Figure out how you're going to get the road built. That's, that's really such a practical approach in life exactly. and which is summarized it in such good words. That's a great example and metaphor I'm going to remember. Absolutely. They'll help you. Yeah. As I said, and I mean this sincerely, all the people on this call and all the people who listen to it afterwards, if you go back and implement any two or three of the ideas I've shared with you, your life will change. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So true, Dr. Rao. We have another question uh, from Puneet Merotra. Dr. Rao, what is your approach to self-discovery and enabling the same in your clients? How do you take the discovery findings forward for learning and growth? Self-discovery is a lifelong process. And I guess the best way to answer the question is to uh, have the person read the syllabus of my course. It's a pretty volume, lo long document. It's on, it's on my website, and I'll have Jackie send you a copy and also the link on my website so you can you know share that with the persons yes. on the call. I've downloaded that. I think it's 54 pages, and I was overwhelmed taking a printout of it and going through it. It was So if you haven't already, amazing. please share it with uh, your sure. members, and that's probably the best way to get at that. Uh, before someone comes in a coaching, uh, before I accept anyone as a coaching client, they have to go through my syllabus and they have to resonate with it. And if they don't, then I don't work with them. Yeah. And I guess you also have a reading list that also goes along with that. Yes. I'll have Jackie send you the whole syllabus and sure. uh, please share it with your members. Perfect. I'll do that. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Viji. Dr. Rao, could you please elaborate the nuance between resilience and extreme resilience that you referred to earlier in our conversation? Resilience is your ability to bounce back when you've suffered an adversity. And uh, obviously, it's a highly prized one. Extreme resilience is bouncing back so fast that an external observer might not even know that you had suffered an adverse event. So the speed of the bounce back is what makes it extreme resilience. Okay. Another question is, who are those spiritual masters that have the biggest influences on you and any of the top messages that you would like to share with us now? Oh, there are many of them. I mentioned a couple already. Sri Ramana Maharshi is probably the single greatest influence on my life. But there are many others. There's the Sargadatta Maharaj, there's Adi Shankaracharya, there's uh, uh, Ramdas, as I mentioned before. Uh, there's a Jesuit priest called Anthony de Mello. Then uh, many of the Sufis, uh, Rumi, Kabir, Hafiz. And the best way, again, is uh, go to my syllabus. And in the bibliography that you mentioned, Pradeep, there is a mm -hmm. section called Life-Changing Books. Uh, 
Okay. And uh, that will give the person a pretty good idea of which are the sources from which I draw my material. They come from all traditions in the world, all of the major wisdom traditions. Uh, indeed, uh, grateful to you, uh, Dr. Rao, for having that compiled. And uh, I'll send it across to everybody. Uh, yes, please. It will be very useful, I'm sure. Sure. Anuradha Sant asks, how do you maintain an equilibrium in your life and thought process at all times without the overwhelm? The overwhelm is simply mental chatter, Pradeep. Oh my God, there's so much to do. I don't have enough time to do it all. I have to do this. I have to do that. Why do I have to do this? I don't like doing it. It's all mental chatter. When you become your mental chatter, you become overwhelmed. But when you can step aside and see that it's mental chatter going on, then you're not overwhelmed. Then you simply pick whatever task you are and you do it there. When you wash the dishes, you wash the dishes. And you will find that you will get a great deal more done than you ever thought possible and you will get it done better. Just observe your mental chatter, don't become your mental chatter. Remember, that was a very profound saying I shared with you. The purpose of washing dishes is not to get them clean. The purpose of washing dishes is to wash the dishes. Yes. Another All right, question. one more question, and I think yes. we'll be done for today. Yes. Uh, the question is, most often, uh, this is sent by someone in anonymity. Most often, I get bogged down by other people's opinions. I've tried hard, but haven't been able to tackle this successfully. Uh, please suggest what is the way out for this. Yeah, other people's ex opinions is something... Everybody gets bothered by that. Uh, one of the most popular questions that I get, I state that one of the <clears throat> benefits of my course is you will stop being bothered by what someone else thinks about you. And we're always bothered, what will they think of me? And I can answer that question very easily. What will they think of you? They will not think of you. You know, we go through life and we're concerned about everybody's opinion. So what we think everybody's opinion is, and we think that they are thinking about us and having an opinion about us. The bold fact is they're not. You're going around life, watching the movie of your life, and you think everybody is watching the movie of your life. But everybody is not watching the movie of your life. They're watching the movie of their life. And in the movie of their life, you are a bit presence if you're a presence at all. So once you recognize that in your mental chatter, what will they think of me? What will they think of me? Then if you recognize it's just mental chatter, you can let that go. But you have to work hard at becoming the witness of your mental chatter, not being carried away by your mental chatter. But I can assure you that if you're thinking, what do they think of me? The answer is, they're not thinking anything of you. They're not thinking of you at all. You're thinking that they are thinking about you. They're not. Yes, that's true. And uh, we find and give this so much of significance, in fact. Yes. I'm sure that's a great answer to the question that this person has asked. Um, uh, shall we take one more question, Dr. Okay. Rao? Yeah, and this is the last yeah. one. Yeah, Go. okay. How do you hold back uh, models templates uh, for want of me expressing differently in the now that worked for your life and those who influenced your life vis-a-vis -vis enabling the emergence of models of those whom you coach for them to blossom? I'm not sure I understand the question. Yeah. Uh, Uday, would you want to unmute yourself and quickly ask this question? Yes, uh, I will. Uh, uh, let me rephrase. Uh, you know, when I listen to you, there's a lot to pick up from your experiences and what you've been through in life, both in terms of what you work through as well as influences of others in your life, which is very valid, legitimate. But while coaching others, how do you hold back? These models and templates work for you and uh, 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 others who help you grow vis-a-vis -vis enabling growth in those whom you coach. What happens is enabling growth is simply a process of getting them to understand 
what is holding them back remember it's never a question of you know one of my philosophy philosophies of leadership is that it's not a function of a leader to motivate his followers or her followers it is the function of a leader to find out what is demotivating his or her followers and getting rid of them this is not semantic hair splitting this is a profoundly different philosophical orientation in exactly the same way you don't make them grow you help them grow by identifying the obstacles that are helping that are preventing them from growing and you don't remove those obstacles you illuminate them so that they understand this is what is preventing me and the first step always is getting them to understand how powerful mental chatter is and how it is the root cause of the majority of the problems that we are all facing and as they recognize it and as they recognize the power they will come to you by saying how do i deal with this demon and then you start helping them with that so it's a tried and proven process and that's something that i recommend you experiment with till you feel comfortable with your own way of communicating that It's been wonderful being with you uh, Pradeep and Ujwal thank you very much for giving me the opportunity and let me wish everyone on this call a terrific week month year in fact a terrific rest of your life <laughs> thank you thank you very much uh, dr rao for that wonderful session that you had with us very insightful really moving and inspiring and more importantly than anything else i think what what has been left behind are pearls of wisdom for reflection from all of us uh thank you very much uh, dr rao and uh, uh, we look forward to jacqueline's mail uh, because a lot of them are putting on chat that they want to uh, go through the syllabus and the book list and Absolutely. for everybody we will be sharing the same thank you very much very welcome thank bye you dr rao bye everybody thank you